Welcome to Network and Learn. Um, uh, I'm excited to, to, yeah, take two. Thank you, Mindy. Uh, I'm excited to uh, be back in the back in the UDL game with uh, a great group of panelists as we talk about uh, design and design thinking and UDL and what their intersection is. Um, and uh, tonight I'm joined by a great group of panelists uh, who are deep, deep in the UDL, uh, in the UDL world and UDL game as well as in the design game. So um, as we go through, uh, you'll see that <clears throat> Uh, we have a live stream that's up on YouTube, so you can check us out at the UDL IRN um, uh, channel on YouTube, and you can follow along there. Um, you can send us questions. Really, really important to us that, uh, that we have our questions uh, for our panelists, uh, because it really relies on not only our, <clears throat> our panelists and their, and their brilliant knowledge, but also um, on you folks sending us some questions. So if you're, if you're hitting us from the tweet, uh, from the Twitter sphere and the Twitterverse, uh, you can use the hashtag UDLIRN, uh, and Sue Harden and Corinne Hauer will be mon monitoring uh, the Twitter. They will be our social media cow cowgirls and um, wrangling up the best questions and sending them our way. I will be um, taking those questions and we'll be answering them uh, and getting you the answers as, uh, as they come up. Uh, so uh, I don't want to spend too much time kind of talking about that side of things. As I said before, um, we are streaming live on YouTube uh, currently, and uh, that's the link. If you, want to, if you want to take that link and you want to tweet it out to your friends and your networks and your PLNs and your grandmother and whomever else may be out there that want to, want to watch uh, this fantastic dialogue, please do so, uh, and then they can just join along as well. But without further ado, I want to introduce our panelists. Um, as I said before, I'm Brian Dean, uh, and then I guess to my right, at least on my screen, uh, is Sue Harden, uh, another member of the UDL IRN. She's on the executive board and she's the head of the PL committee. Um, and uh, she's been in the UDL game for a long time. Uh, she's muted currently, but if she wants to drop in and say hello, she's more than welcome to. Uh, well, wait. Uh, I, I'll say hello. Oh, I just wanted to uh, say that when um, Brian introduced me to uh, Kim virtually, he called me a legend. And I, I just wondered if that just meant I was old. <laughs> no, not at all. And you'll never catch me. We're recording this, this webinar live, so uh, you'll never catch me saying that, uh, for sure. I uh, know Sue is a legend in the UDL world. Uh, she's a legend in my UDL world, at the very least. Uh, but, but a lot of people, when you say, uh, when you talk uh, assistive technology and you talk universal design for learning, uh, if, you're not, if, you, if you know what you're doing, you're also talking about Sue Harden. So um, Sue Harden, everybody dropped in, said hello. Our newest member. Uh, to the PL committee, but also a strong UDL person uh, and uh, up and comer and doing some great work in Michigan as well is uh, Corinne Howard. Uh, she's also blacked out her screen, um, <clears throat> but she's, uh, sure. oh, there she is. See, there she is. And she, and she appears out of nowhere. Uh, so she's up in Muskegon. Uh, so we got the Michigan tribe rolling strong today uh, for UDL IRN. So uh, that's Corinne, right. I get to be the, uh, Brian and Sue's groupie on the west side of the state. So welcome, everyone. Uh, so and you'll see some amazing things coming from Corinne uh, for the for the IRN. We are very, very lucky to have her on board as well. And then that brings us to our panelists. Uh, so I'm just going to go along our line here um, and I'm going to pull up their pictures here. Now, I tried. I got to be honest with you, Kim and Tanya. I really did try to find uh, the funniest pictures I could of you folks. And then I found them. And then I buried them, so you don't have to worry about them on social media anywhere. Okay. <laughs> uh, so we have uh, uh, Kim Ducharme. Uh, uh, am I saying that right, Kim? She looks a little frozen. I'm going to take the silence as a yes. Uh, we have Kim Ducharme. Uh, she's uh, right now sitting by the lake, so she's um, working on her connectivity. Uh, she works out at CAST, and if you are, know anything about UDL, then you know about CAST. Uh, it's... it's sort of the birthplace of, of UDL. So we're very lucky to have her. Uh, she's the director of educational user experience design, which by the way, is probably one of the, one of the coolest titles I've ever heard. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, it's hard to say, but it sounds so cool. So what do you do for a living? Well, I'm a director of educational user experience and design, you know, nothing, nothing big, you know, um, so, uh, welcome, Kim. You can follow Kim on Twitter at Kim Ducharme. Am I saying that correctly, Kim? I just want to make sure. Yes, exactly. yes, that's what I thought. I just didn't want to be the guy that uh, started calling you Kim Ducharme. Um, I thought maybe that, that, that wasn't the pronunciation. So, you can follow her at Kim Ducharme on uh, Twitter. Um, 
So welcome, Kim. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to let them tell you kind of about their UDL, uh -huh. their UDL life and do a little more intro. Uh, and then the other uh, panelist that we have today is Tanya Leon. If that's correct, right, Leon? That it. Leon, plain old and American eyes. Oh, Leon, OK. All right, Tanya the Lion, uh, Tanya <laughs> Leon, like uh, <laughs> seventh grade English uh, department chair out at Richards Middle School in Fraser, Michigan. I told you the Michigan tribe is strong, folks. Yeah. And, and you can follow her on Twitter at Mrs. Uh, TL or Mrs. T Leon. So there we are. Um, and I just want to give you the schedule of kind of where we're going tonight. Again, remember, submit your questions on Twitter using the hashtag UDLIRN, or if you are one of our panelists, uh, just go ahead, and, or I'm sorry, one of our attendees in the in the actual webinar, go ahead and throw them in the chat and uh, both Sue and Corinne will wrangle those up for us. But here's how we kind of plan out our night. We do a little uh, do a little bit of talking and then we do a little bit of checking for questions and then we do a little more talking. Um, so uh, part one, we're gonna, we just got through kind of our introductions of our panel, but I really think that it's important for when we connect with, our, with, with everybody that, you know, UDL is such a personal story and how we got there and um, finding what we believe and, and um, you know, kind of finding what it's, how it's redefined our, our paradigms as educators. So for me, it's really important to hear what our panelists have to say about their UDL journey. And then we'll check for some questions. Um, and then we'll go on to part two, which is uh, Kim will take the show and, and um, talk about design thinking and UDL at CAST. Some questions for her. And then uh, part three, redesigning space, that'll be Tanya's area talking about uh, some of the amazing things that she's done in her own classroom and uh, the problems that she was trying to work with and, and solve through those. So without further ado, uh, let's start with you, Tanya. Tanya, how'd you come about, uh, how'd you come to your UDL journey? What's that, what's that look like for you? Um, you know, we, our district in Fraser, we're focused on customized learning and personalized learning through competency-based education. And so through that, over the last five years or so, we've really spent a lot of time analyzing and digging into how we can reach each student where they are using that UDL framework and modern teacher and all kinds of different resources and research to kind of get us to meet the needs of each student in our classroom. So that kind of started our journey and started us down the road that got me to eventually to the flexible seating that we're going to talk about later tonight and um, just doing our best to customize everything we can to make students um, directed in their own learning, advocates for their learning, in charge of their own learning, uh, and paths that are unique for each of them to be successful. I love, I love that when you say anytime I get little goosebumps, you, you might not be able to see them folks, but they're there. <laughs> uh, I get goosebumps every time we, we, we talk about learner agency and really dive into what that means and not just about our space, but who we are as learners and finding that journey. I love it. I'm so excited to hear it. Yay. Kim, what about you? So, uh, how did I come upon design thinking and UDL? <laughs> well, um, so I have a background in, um, in design and science, but particularly in design, um, the amazing thing is about design thinking, I think, is that it kind of demystifies the creative process, right? And it's applicable to virtually any thing and any problem and it's wonderfully focused on the user or the audience if you will so it really keeps you kind of honest and asking the right questions um, so when it comes to udl universal design for learning you know where we're using this framework to try to make lessons more flexible um, we're creating um, instructional um, educational environments and tools um, for all of that, as well as for teaching teachers how to implement UDL. It really helps to have this tool in your pocket, which is design thinking. So I use it in a lot of different ways, and I'll, I'll give you an example through uh, the slides that I shared, uh, that I'll share with you uh, about some particular ways in which I've used it. I, I love I love that. Uh, so did you start, I just, just for my own clarification, Kim, did you start in the world of education or did you start outside of that and kind of come to education and design thinking? So I started in the world of biology decided I really loved design but I really didn't want to do kind of commercial art right so right. I'm dating myself 
I stumbled upon the uh, Exploratorium's uh, exhibit design room where they created all of the exhibits for the science. And oh, I, nice. the light bulb went off. Yeah. So I'm, I, I'm a learner, you know, lifelong learner as we all are. And I discovered that I could actually combine. Then I went to design school came to Boston, knocked on the door at WGBH and said, this is where I want to work. And so I worked there for about 17 years, right? Creating um, design for education, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then, now, now I'm really in the thick of it. <laughs> right. Exactly. Now, you know, like that, that, that title, while it's a cool title, I mean, it's a heavy title. You know, I mean, yeah. if we really kind of pick that title apart, you know, uh, you know, the idea of, of user design and user and designing user experience is, mm -hmm. I mean, you have to have just such a, a just such a, a, a huge amount of empathy, you know, that you have to step into. But then, like you say, you have to, like, it can be sometimes creativity can, you know, it can be a rabbit hole, right? And like, you just oh. end up kind of going down it. And so I love that phrasing that you use that it, it adds this kind of, architecture the structure to to creativity yeah. so i love yeah. that and 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 it mirrors so perfectly with what what kind of tanya was saying too as a you know especially if you're you're teaching seventh grade tanya like that's i gotta be honest as a as an educator myself seventh grade that's no joke right like like you gotta it's have some love. No, it's not for the pain of heart <laughs> yeah exactly it's no joke uh you gotta you gotta have legit skills and you and and those legit skills are not just from that knowledge currency right um it's it comes from it comes from that design and that creative currency too and so um so though it's just it, i love that you are both on the panel because i think that you have two different perspectives but to really like the really their background is very very similar so without further ado i i, I don't want to take up too much time um with me talking i really want to dive into uh kind of the first the first presentation side of things that we have where where we really just kind of have uh, a structured dialogue. Um, and so that's, that's Kim's area. Um, and I'll share my screen again so that we can share not only our faces as we're talking, but also um, we can share uh, your, I'm sorry, your, um, your presentation as well. So here we go. So I'm gonna let you take it from there, um, Kim, and, and just kind of dive in. So can everybody see that that's, uh, that's, that's on the call so that we can move through it? Yeah, cool. you can All right. go to the slide. Yeah, for sure. Okay, we'll start there. All right, so maybe you should click the uh, present. Yeah, so, yep, absolutely, nope. Just some words there won't make sense. Yeah, for sure, I gotcha. How are we feeling? Yeah, Can we see that? Is that better? Everybody good? Okay. Yeah. All right. So basically, um, I'm going to talk about this intersection of design thinking and universal design for learning. Um, and just to put one more point on coming to user experience design for education, which is that it, it's a little bit of an interesting intersection because there's that whole layer of educational goals, right? And in design thinking, you're looking right at the user needs, but you also need to look at the needs of, you know, the uh, curriculum and all of that. So it's, it's complex um, and design thinking is for solving wicked problems. So it's really great. So what you're looking at here it, on the left, you see design thinking on the right um, UDL kind of the components. Um, so if you look at um let's go first to design uh, to udl and then we'll look back at design thinking so if you go to the next slide brian yep so these are the no one these yeah that's okay. the one gotcha. so i just want to quickly touch uh based on the structure of the udl guidelines um so basically we if you look at the horizontal band so what you see here are three principles of udl so the multiple provide multiple means of engagement representation and action and expression right so those are these um vertical columns but now if you look at the horizontal bands really what we do is kind of 
looking up work from the ground up if you look at the bottom row that is really all about access so we're, we're we think about removing barriers to access to instruction the next row up is supporting the building of learning process skills and the highest level is creating expert learners who are purposeful and motivated resourceful and knowledgeable and strategic and goal directed so that really is the ultimate goal of UDL. Um, okay, so think about uh, these goals and now we'll look at the next slide. Oops, so sorry. I uh, came out of my present. Let me go back into it. I don't know what happened. Mm -hmm. My fault. I don't know what happened. Here we go. All right. There we go. Next slide. There we are. Great. Okay. And just by the way, I apologize if I cut out uh, my internet connectivity is a little bit strange here. So far, so good. Okay. So for design thinking, really, it's about uh, problem finding, problem solving and solution testing. And in that first set of sort of creating choices and making choices, so it's like diverging and converging, that's all about building empathy and defining a problem. And you know what you know what they say if you've got 24 hours to solve a problem spend 23 of those out of those hours making sure you're asking the right problem so that's why design thinking is just so crucial to any design process yeah. and then uh, then what you want to do is kind of build um, prototypes to test whether or not you your idea solves the problem mm -hmm. so that in a nutshell is design thinking if you go to the next slide certainly Okay, so as a user experience designer, I love, uh, you know, working in this kind of hybrid zone and I borrow tools from other disciplines. So this is a uh, tool journey mapping is from kind of service design and it's all about looking at an experience over time. And some of the common components um, you see are phases, you see kind of uh, an emotion line, Mm -hmm. And oftentimes you'll see annotations describing what might be going on at those inflection points. Let's have a look at one more of these journey maps. The next slide. This is another one, and I just want to point out that sometimes you can even look at multiple kind of lenses around the emotional experience, uh, which I think is kind of cool. So you know, I asked myself, why not use this tool to create better lesson plans? So if you look at the next slide. I love that. Right, so this is uh, a circuits lesson and I use this a lot uh, in workshops for educators uh, to think about ideating better lesson plans. So basically, um, in a perfect world, you'd be a fly on the wall and be uh, observing uh, a student experiencing a lesson or we'll use personas and just try to imagine that experience. Yeah. And we go back and put on our grown up educator hat and think about what was that experience over time and so you'll see they've got this kind of emotion line and it's annotated mm -hmm. right so if you look at the next slide so there they're kind of hashing through what was going on in the lesson and then the next slide so here you are here you have this intel right you've built built some empathy using this tool and you can see some areas that are um, opportunities to brainstorm so you they're, they're pain points right so maybe there's yeah. some barriers happening so you can you apply the principles of udl and brainstorm and ideate around what are good solutions right the how might we is a classic brainstorm seed starter question. Sure. Okay, sure. and then the next slide, I'm trying to breeze through these. So, so, that's, so that's the idea. So for teachers, you know, we might think about uh, what, what are those ideas that might uh, break through those barriers, and then you would basically test that part of a lesson, right? That's your prototype, is experimenting with that in the classroom and coming back and iterating based on what you learn. So that kind of in a nutshell is, is the high points of how to apply design thinking to lesson plans. So we also apply it at CAST as we're building 
um, environments and tools. And as you see on the left here, really the design process in a perfect world starts with this kind of messy process. Yeah. And it's certain that you, you know, if you, if you all understand, you're going to get to a point of vision, you're gonna to get to a point where you're set on your strategy, then you can kind of relax and trust in this messy process that happens at first. And then as you move to the right, you see, okay, we are fairly certain from our very uh, kind of lean and agile uh, testing of ideas through prototypes, mm -hmm. we now have a vision, we have an idea that we think works well. And then we go on into, uh, uh, yeah, a uh, process of agile development and continuous discovery because there are all sorts of new little things to figure out along the way. You don't have it all figured out, but that's kind of the basic process from a uh, 20,000 foot view. Um, and I think that is all, is it? Yeah, so that's that's it in a nutshell. Okay. Right. I, I, I have to tell you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna escape out of it so that, um, we can go back and just kind of have a conversation of us. Uh, you just, um, you just partially, you just blew my mind a little bit. Um, well, actually a lot, Kim, and I love it. Um, because, you know, whenever I'm talking uh, with other, with other educators or practitioners, and we're kind of having this conversation about, uh, you know, the design process and really how, you know, when we talk about universal design for learning, one of the big pieces we always hit is the accessibility point. And we know that we're going to hit about the variability point because that resonates with everybody and that. And then you say, you know, if variability is something that we know exists in every person, then we can design for it. Well, that's a great statement, but then how do you get down to it? And this, and, and the idea of the affinity map is really, is really one that I think gets glossed over a little bit in design, right? Especially like instructional design, we see it like if we're designing online learning, but but when we talk about really learning design, the idea of, of designing the scope, trajectory, the, the, the social, emotional learning, all of those pieces in, in, in learning, lesson planning is one of the last things we do, right? And it, and, and it, but it, I mean, obviously it takes up a, a ton of our time as educators, but it really has to be one of those last things because we have to look at what is the narrative of our students or the empathy of our students and then we have to define that and start distilling that. I, I, so the mapping is, um, is just really, it's, it really brings into focus and clarity how complex that can be, but also really how simple it is to start and the adaptiveness of that system. So I, I absolutely love it. But do you find that, like how many, so when you're running a workshop or when you're kind of discussing this or you're talking with other educators about this, like, are they overwhelmed with the idea of the affinity map? Uh, I don't know. The, the journey map? No, yeah, I'm sorry, I, I the journey think, map. Though, I think that people are really um, enthusiastic about it, mm. right? Because people can get overwhelmed with the whole, the UDL guidelines and trying to hit off all the checkpoints and, yeah. you know, us reassuring not, you know, really the way to go about it is to look at the context. So I think a couple of things the journey map does is it allows you to look at the specific context, right? Because even in each of us, there's variability, right? It's mm -hmm. so it allows you to look at a point in time and, you know, realize that there, there are all these um, criteria and these uh, emotions going through the student and there are other students. Yeah, no, I think it feels to educators like a good tool in that yeah. way. Well, and and I would I would you know I would have ventured to guess that yeah I think that they kind of res it resonates with with educators, um, and I think that part of that has to do with the same thing that happens in universal design when you're first introducing it. Oftentimes, you know, people are like, "Well, I do a lot of this, right?" And then the question is, "Are you doing it intentionally?" Right? Like that's a big piece of it, but the same thing happens with the journey map, right? Like, yeah, I'm already doing parts of this. I'm already thinking about high points and all these things, but are you doing it with intentionality? Becomes a big question. And then this tool lends itself to that. Oh, it's brilliant. Um, I could spend hours talking about it, but I wanna go to uh, some of our people out there and go to Corinne and Sue uh, and see if uh, we got any questions out there. I'm sure that we got a ton. 
So uh, Sue, Corinne, what are we, what are we uh, bringing, bringing, what are we wrapping up? I'll start, Brian. Um, I think we should put out a good call for questions. Um, we, we've got quite a few comments. Everybody's really interested in um, the idea of the intentionality of design. And um, Cheryl was asking a little bit about uh, how, how the, um, she said that the emotion, the layering of emotion across the design process was really interesting to, to her. And I wondered if maybe um, Kim could go into a little more detail about how that fits into the um, design thinking process and how that intersects with UDL. Sure. So do you want me to do that now? Yeah, go for it. It's your world. Go okay. ahead, Kim. Okay. Um, so it might be helpful. Well, maybe you remember um, the left hand side of the um, UDL guidelines is all around engagement, right? So that's, you know, driven internally by your emotions. Um, so I think the way that um, we use that kind of engagement line is to think about what's going on with my engagement and where I'm, for example, possibly losing a student or you know they're getting stressed out because they're either bored or something's going on at home or they're getting behind, you know getting confused about the lesson those are just sort of signals if you will to think about that point in time where the their the engagement might be dipping or going too high you know either way and using that as as the brainstorming point what's going on let's get a little deeper into our empathy around the, what's going on and now let's ideate given all we know about the context at that time for that student let's brainstorm um, some solutions right and and i i didn't go into detail on the whole idea of uh de design thinking being cross-disciplinary but i just want to put in a shout out for um encouraging teachers to pull in um, colleagues and uh, different thinkers and even students you know the big um, idea of participatory design is really great and giving the students agency in figuring out their own solutions is also fantastic i don't know if that answers your question but more thoughts well, and, and you know, I think that it's it's interesting because if you do look at that engagement trend, right? Like the the very if we look at that that bottom area of removing barriers and access to instruction, that's for recruiting interest, right? Like that's just the beginning point. There's really has to be something that that keeps sustaining effort over and over again, and then a way to, to not to kind of hand the the agency of that engagement back over to the student and say. So now how are you going to do that through, through yourself? Like what is your agency in doing so? What is your regulation in doing so? Right. Exactly. Yeah. And how, yeah, how are they managing their own self-regulation, right? Yeah. And, yeah. Cause we can yeah. create really great yeah. beginners, right? Like really great inclusive activities that really bring them in, but, yeah. but we have to eventually kind of give them that agency over it. And so That's bringing in yeah. all your, all your other people that just defines that, that narrative that is being woven. Yeah, mm -hmm. I love that. I love that. Do we have any other uh, questions, Corinne or, or, or Sue? For yeah. Uh, yeah, we've got a bunch of questions coming in in the chat window, Brian. Um, a couple of people just wanted to know, Kim, where you start this process. Um, you know, do you, you mentioned the lesson reflection, but in terms of turning that around for planning, do you plan a lesson, um, a unit? You know, how do you get, how does one get started in this process? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, you know, so I, I'm a designer and the, so I'm not in the classroom teaching. Um, so just to say where I would, where I start anything is by being curious. Um, and that's, you know, that, that's all about kind of asking the right questions and that. So um, as a teacher, that might translate to, 
um, you know, reflecting at the end of class. Because what you want to do is figure out, you know, where your kind of pain points are and where your students' strengths are. So if you could take the time to reflect and use those insights as opportunities to either do some ideating and some experimenting or um, I identifying places where you might have conversations with your students or as even a single student right to do that kind of process together those would be two places to start that's cool and kim i think you kind of hit on uh, another question to um I believe it was Chrissy had asked if you do that that brainstorming along with the users to kind of get their feedback about what their visual map might look like of of a lesson or an experience. So talking about that that end user experience, it sounds like you do um, it recommend taking the time to do that with students when you can. Yeah, and in fact, the journey map is a great tool for that for a conversation. You can um, show them a simplified version of you know, the lesson and say, you know, just give me, depending on their age, right? Give me, you know, a thumbs up or a thumbs down or a thumbs sideways along the way. And then use those as discussion points. Um, that's a nice way to use that as well. Um, we, Sue, I don't know what you have coming from uh, Twitter. I do have a couple more questions here from the chat window, but if you've got some you want to pose. Keep going, Corinne. You're doing great. Okay. So we had another really, here's a, here's a deep thinker, Kim. So um, asking if you draw on cultural fr frameworks alongside the UDL and design thinking and um, how you interweave each of those if that's that's the case uh, sorry what's the question exactly if you um along with the udl framework and your design thinking process if you also draw on cultural frameworks um considering you know background and culture of the of your students in your class and and uh, research on cultural frameworks and how that might be integrated as well um I'm not sure. Um, I think you know, there's so many uh, levels to design thinking. You know, so the first thing I think about it, and that I actually try to puzzle over myself a lot, is how to do design thinking with different kinds of participants. So, you know, people from different backgrounds, um, you know, are going to have of different sensitivities and different comfort levels with different parts of those activities, right? Some people don't want to collaborate, rather go and do their individual thing. So <clears throat> I would say even within the de design thinking process, being sensitive to cultural differences and norms among your students um, will help you go through that kind of process with your students if you want to and another thing is just having the insights of where uh, there might be um, cultural mismatches or clashes you know with some thing you're doing in the classroom or uh, the topic of a lesson or anything like that you know they're, they're all just kind of opportunities i think to these inflection points are opportunities to kind of ideate and experiment and intentionally uh, try things out with um, whatever it is you're trying to do better with. Very good, um, Brian. We've got we've got one more. Um, well, we got lots of questions coming in, but. Um, We've got one more question here. Um, someone wanted to see the example of the journey map again, and I don't know if they maybe jumped on late if we can, can zoom over to that, but also um, asking about, don't you think uh, from Kathleen, she was wondering, do you think that consistent access is required to continue the engagement? And then asking if she could see um, an example of that journey map again. 
actually yeah so these are just journey maps from the service design industry um, and the next one uh, that's also but this is the one that i've used this is only part of one brian maybe what i can do is share the full journey map the one that has the udl swim lanes along the bottom if there's a way that i could share that out with everyone i'd be happy to do that uh, it's yeah, a great sure. template for sure um if you want to send it we can we can put it up uh in the twitter feed but um also uh, you have the option to share on your screen as well if you go into the more uh there's a area that says you can share your um i'll stop sharing and then you will be able to share your screen if you want to um and maybe then I'll give you... i'm sorry go ahead i think maybe what i'll do is uh put a link into the panel that way that'll be preserved right oh yeah so for sure yeah. Yep. Okay. Absolutely. That's a that's another great way that we can do it, and then uh, people can kind of look at it. Um, sure. And and a lot of people are asking for like, well, can we see some more of it? And I think that's actually this really that's great. Sure. Yeah, and it's a great segue into into Tanya's piece um, because because it's really hers is a really great um, kind of journey into uh, kind of trying to solve that problem or finding the problem, and then talking about how do we solve it. So. Um, I'm gonna, we'll, we'll have some questions for Tanya and then we'll bring it all back together and kind of ask for the mixing of some of the questions as well. So um, thank you so much, Kim. You've, you've really opened up the conversation and uh, I, I, I'm really looking forward to Tanya's kind of piece on it as well. So, uh, so without further ado, uh, Tanya uh, Leon uh, from Fraser, uh, working with seventh grade, uh, do you wanna take us through your piece? Yep, that sounds great. If you want to pull that up. Yeah, for sure. And uh, you'll just have to give me some verbal prompts because when I go into a full screen, I can't, <laughs> uh, I can't see you guys. So just uh, give me some right. uh, verbal prompts and I will be happy to move us along. Okay, so um, she did a great job of really explaining the design thing, which kind of got me to where I am today with the flexible learning. So I would say four or five years ago, flexible learning was kind of the hot topic. Flexible seating was the hot topic. Uh, and so about five years ago, I got some furniture, painted my walls, and I did some things because that was gaining steam in, in education was flexible seating in the classroom. And then I realized that it, my room looked really great, but that I wasn't changing the learning and impacting the learning. So um, I sat down and I redefined my goal and I found the problem I was really trying to answer because at the end of the day, a pretty classroom isn't effective, it's just pretty. So okay. the problem I sat down that I found that I, that I really started thinking about my learners and what they needed and what we needed to be doing for them <clears throat> was this, I needed a structure in my classroom that was going to help meet the needs of all of my learners and specifically the thing that I felt that we were feeling at, I was feeling at, year after year after year was writing because writing with a whole group of 30 to 35 kids if you've ever been in a classroom with seventh graders is impossible to do all at once so yeah. my problem was trying to get my students isolated in smaller groups or one-on-one -on -one, and i had to build a structure to do that <clears throat> and so i started thinking of how i was going to make that work now um, station-based and workshop models are are fairly popular in the elementary scene, but not so much in the secondary scene, although that's been gaining steam. So about four years ago, I sat down, I kind of reworked what I was gonna do. And if you could go to the next slide for me, please. Um, and thinking of that customized learning and thinking of my, my learners, you can go ahead and put all those up. Um, and thinking of my learners and what they needed, uh, and that problem of trying to get to every student, I decided that there was no way I could instruct 35 kids at once anymore, or 30 kids at once, or in a great class, 25 kids at once. Um, so I decided I had to make a model that was going to allow me to answer that problem, to fix that problem, to get my kids alone or in small groups and teach writing on a much, much closer basis. So I started splitting my students up into three different rotating groups. Uh, the first one on your left down there is my writing group, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. And that's where I got a small group of writers together where we could go through the whole writing process together from drafting to revising to publishing 
um, it, with just those few kids and me all together. So my problem then after that was, well, what am I going to do with the other two thirds of my class when I have this one section pulled off to the side for small group work? So I designed some other stations or workshop areas for them to be in. That middle picture is the independent group, and I'll explain that a little bit more in a minute too, where I decided to utilize some of the technology that we had to engage students where they were as far as their level went. And this is kind of where I pulled in a lot of the UDL thinking, and I programmed our LMS to deliver content for them based on their needs and their interests. So they all pretest in the state in the learning management system. And then depending on their pretest score, they get delivered different content to help them all reach the same level of proficiency. So um, customized and tailored to what they need to keep them interested. There's lots of gaming formats in there. There are activities where they choose their, you know, their pop culture interests, and then it kind of delivers the content that way uh, through a tool that we love. And then the last third of the group over on the right is my collaborative group where I had them working together to answer big questions and choose the way they were demonstrating big reading competencies that we had learned together throughout our literature unit. Um, can you go to the next slide for me, please? <clears throat> Thank you. Um, and you can pull both these up too. Thank you. Uh, so that first um, small group, like I talked about, you know, this was really the problem. This was my driving feature, my driving, driving problem, and the, the way I designed uh, the learning in my classroom was that I needed to work with these students. So you'll see here that this is, uh, I work with anywhere from six to seven to eight students at a time, uh, working through the whole writing process start to finish. Uh, and the great thing about that is, you know, so much of the grading gets done with me, one-to-one, face-to-face, -to -face, because we're not waiting till the paper's turned in for all the feedback. It's feedback during the entire process as they go. Uh, so the first design, the environment design piece as we went then, was I wanted a, a structure here that was going to fit with, you know, the most amicable position for them in, to work. So they're at their kidney tables so I can kind of sit in the middle with them and work with them. Those are whiteboard tables too, so they can jot all their ideas down on the table and brainstorm together just right on the table in front of them. Uh, at this particular station where they're writing, it's very important that they have these plain old, what we consider now, boring chairs, because there's a lot of research behind needing to have that good writing posture, whether they're typing or writing. So very intentional here with how I chose seating. It looks boring, but it's very functional because it allows them to have that writing posture to develop the muscles and the leverage to really get that substantial uh, writing done. So that's kind of, and that's the only group that I work directly with when we're in this rotation model. Uh, and that's kind of the driving force behind this. Go ahead and you go to the next slide for me, please. Thank you. And so then <clears throat> another group, uh, this is kind of where it started to get a little bit more fun. I mean, it was effective in the writers, but this is a little more fun for the kids. Um, we're doing big projects now, I and mean, we're one-to-one -one in our district. So then designing activities where um, using the UDL framework, it's no longer just me giving a project so much as them getting the voice and the choice to choose how to demonstrate their competency, how to demonstrate and show me their understanding. Uh, so on the left, this picture here, we have uh, a cafe table because a lot of my kids have told me, you know, when I went through the design process, I got some input on what they wanted. And for a very simple reason, they say that they love the cafe tables because they feel it makes them feel older. Um, so, but they like to be able to stand while they're collaborating and talking together. And some of my kids can stand here while other kids are sit seated in these higher bar stools. Uh, and they love that. The, <clears throat> the picture on the bottom right, uh, again, this is a group working together. I've whiteboard surfaced every possible surface that I've been able to do so far so they can collaborate and see what they're doing. And then just this last year, uh, you'll notice there's a table with some um, bouncier chairs and a TV up in the top right corner. Uh, and this is a collaboration station. I have two of these in my room so that when they're doing these group projects together, they can sit, project their iPad, and work together more easily instead of all hovering around an eight-inch device screen. Now they have something to project their, their um, projects on together to brainstorm, collaborate, edit right there. Everyone can see the volume works through their Apple TV. Um, it's been really powerful. Um, and you could go to the next one for me. 
<clears throat> and then the thir last third of my class, so they're all split up. I have one third writing, one third doing this group project thing. And then this is kind of the, the fun part where I got a lot of student input as to what kind of seating they would like to do. This is where I've programmed the LMS to deliver content for them um, based on their needs, based on their interests. And because they don't have to have writing posture, because they're not crowding around a table or a TV screen or iPad and they're independent here, they can sit where they want. They can approach it how they want. We talk a lot about choice and being advocates for their own learning um, and their own mastery here. So you'll see there's kids underneath counters. There's kids, I have them laying on, on sofas. They lay on top of the counter sometimes. Um, and they, they get comfy as best as they can and work through getting through the stuff they need to master. And they, they keep track of that through our LMS. And then one more. Um, I'll finish up quickly. <clears throat> um, and then, so then we talk about, you know, universal de design and trying to design for all of our students. And sometimes when we get to independent work, there are kids that just don't need the support. They already know the content and I'm not prepared to waste their time and make them sit through that all over again. So I decided I needed to design a space for enrichment and a place where they could um, step outside the box and not waste time on content they already knew. So if they pre-test proficient right from the get-go, um, they're filtered quickly through one support activity, a test right away, and then they get extra time to do makerspace, coding, um, you name it, just all kinds of things that allow them to really um, think outside the box and not be stuck in a stagnant, I don't need to learn this area. So, Very cool. Yeah. Oh my, oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> Wow, like, so that just blew my mind too, Tanya. Like this is, you have worked through every part that Kim has set up um, and, and the way that the guidelines are set up, right? So you have, you have student agency and autonomy and this expert learner continuum developing, but you also have this really brilliant place of structured choice, right? And, and structured yeah. learning because that's needed too. Right. While we're designing to those margins, we have to understand. We still have to remember that we're trying to incorporate some of that center too. Uh, you that is beautiful, and the depth the depth of design within that is is really really amazing to me. Um, I will say, I mean, just like you know, she talked about the design thinking process, and you know, we'll I'm sure we'll talk about that several times more tonight. Um, it does not get there right away. The implement and the test phase, the ideate phase are so important because there are things that I did the first time and once I implemented them and we tested them, they did not work and we adjusted and we revisited and we redesigned and my room has not looked the same one, one semester, let alone one year. So um, remembering that that flexible seating needs to go with flexible learning in the design thinking and then that revisiting and testing and redesigning it's never a finished process ever it can always be improved and re-implemented and i love that you say that because that's that's the piece right that's that's the thing that this thing didn't just like we were we were here and we decided to do this thing and guess what it was a home run right away right. because oftentimes that's not it that's not what happens at all and it can't happen right and no. you brought your users in and you said so what is the user experience that 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 they that they want and then you you did that gradual release of responsibility and even in that structured area you're, you're doing this beautiful feedback loop where you're saying this is where you're at this is where i see you going where are you going and that's all in the progression of the learning that's happening and and at the beginning you said i had a pretty room right but i didn't have an effective room and and i would dare say that through that process that's where you're at now. Like, this seems very effective. I want to just come work in this space. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it, I think the most powerful thing that I have seen, it's, it's not what I'm doing in the classroom. It's what the students are doing. It's uh -huh. them taking charge of their learning and being aware of what they need to accomplish to increase their understanding. Um, and that, I think, has been the most powerful thing is giving them that choice and, and letting them figure out how, with my help, how to get where they need to go. Yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. So I, I, I mean, I could, again, I could talk to you for hours uh, about, about the things I see and, and, and ask you some questions, but I want to give it to our, uh, to our audience, uh, give it over to Sue and Corinne and see if there's some questions there that, that, that are coming up. I'm sure there are. 
Thank, yeah, Brian, the, first of all, um, Tanya, I love those pictures. Um, I think that's uh, pretty incredible. And I love um, the way you talked about, you know, you, it's an experiment in progress, you know, constantly redesigning and then redesigning. So we have a couple of questions from, panel, um, from, from our uh, audience about that. One is like how uh, much students help you actually design those spaces. You, you mentioned, you know, students are like, yeah, this isn't really working. So how you go about that process, how often, and are students um, giving you ideas and in, in designing those spaces? And also someone else asked about how many students do you typically have on average in your classes? Um, I, teach, I teach 150 students a day um, and that's split up. Sometimes I have low classes of about 20, to 25. Last year I had one section of 35, so it really ranges depending on the hour of the day, but 150 approximately on my caseload. So there's usually on average about 29 to 30 kids in my room um, at a time. Um, I will say too that when once we've kind of established the expectations for independent work and even the collaboration group work, uh, we're fortunate enough to have some more of those collaboration stations like I showed you in my room down in our media center. Uh, so I'm to the point where I trust my groups enough to get kids out of the room, whether they're independent or whether they're um, in the collaboration group. And I can utilize, with a few kids at least, getting them in other spaces to kind of open up some of the room in our classroom. So um, so I had that many kids. And then, I'm sorry, what was the second part of the question? Oh, I think it was just related to how the, the students help with the actual design yeah. of those spaces. So like I said, it's been released in phases. I've gotten most of my money, thankfully, has been um, through grants and through my district has been very generous in supporting this vision. Um, and this last time when I got the collaboration stations and the cafe tables, uh, a lot of that came from brainstorming with them and sitting down and telling, asking them, what do you want and what do you think would be great? You know, I got the cafe tables after talking with my PLC when I had a student tell me, I feel like I'm older when I sit at a bar size table. So. Um, definitely, every time I purchase something new, I'm sitting down with them and brainstorming to see what will they utilize, how will, and then really thinking about how is it going to solve our problem and affect the learning. That's, Tanya, that's such a great, great point that, you know, that that comment is, is something that you can kind of laugh off, right? Like, I feel older when I, when I um, stand at this table or I sit at these tables, but but it's an emotional investment that your students are asking you to make like, and to honor and that you just kind of took that seriously. And then that space, that whole space with the, with, with, you know, the television. And I mean, that's, that's a, that's a meeting room, mm -hmm. right? Where they're really designing stuff. And so there's a, there's this underlying currency that you've put in about social skills and networking and the assumption that you are going to take your work seriously and you're going to take it at a professional level. Ooh, that's that's super intentional. That's very nice. Thank you. Sorry, Corinne, go on. <laughs> no, that's okay. I um I actually have a a couple of questions of my own based on just talking with some teachers about this. And there's a lot of hesitation sometimes on the parts of teachers like that scary like unknown of what's gonna happen when I take kids out of these, you know, really standard groups or rows. And so um there are two questions. Uh what what were your fears or hesitations maybe moving into this? What came true and what surprised you, I guess? Um, you know, I can demonstrate so really nothing surprises me. Um, and I will also say that um, anyone that knows me, you know, Carrie's on here, my assistant superintendent, I'm a very, I love change, I love research, and I'm, I'm pretty open to change. Um, nothing scared me going into this because I had done my research on, um, trying to meet these problems, the effect of flexible seating and student engagement. Uh, so I don't think that I was scared. However, every time I talk to a group of teachers, I understand um, the seating didn't terrify me. Giving up the control to the students initially slightly worried me, but I am always so proud of them. And I always have teachers say, what do you mean you don't know what they're doing today? Because there are days I don't talk to every single kid in my classroom because they're working on an independent learning path while I'm doing writing conferencing with another group. Um, but I trust them and we have supports in place where I can go back later at the end of the day and see what they were doing in the LMS in the learning management system. And I think that's the scariest part is giving up control of being the master 
of the learning in your classroom and turning into the facilitator of the learning in your classroom is the hardest part for a lot of people, but if you just trust your students enough to do it, it really can be amazing and so empowering for you and the students. Yeah, very cool. I think um, most of the te teachers I've talked to have said the same things once they jumped in. Um, it, it really has surprised them that the, the students stepping up now that they're engaged and especially I think the way you've, de you've designed it as their designers in the process mm -hmm. of it, um, you know, really helps helps that engagement and helps them be res take responsibility and take ownership in that. Um, can you talk a little bit about the routines that you use, um, how you front load those, those kind of expectations and routines at the front of the class year, um, the room, or the front of the school year and then across, um, across the school year, the beginning of class and across the school year? Yeah. Teachers are familiar with having student input in classroom rules, and the same thing goes for the learning environment. At the beginning of the year, we have students experiment with the environment and then brainstorm and collaborate together and go to a certain section or a certain specific piece of furniture, and they tell me what they think the expectations would be at that particular station or learning environment or type of furniture. Um, and once the students define that expectation and we talk about it and debrief about it, they're golden. I mean, they, I'm not the one that has delivered that lecture. They have told me how it should be used. They tell me, hey, Miss Leon, I probably shouldn't pick the ball out of this ball chair and throw it across the room. And I've not had to say that. They have figured that out for themselves. So it's a lot about putting, again, the learning back on the students. And the second you tell them to be the discoverers of the expectations and the rules, they just get it. Mm -hmm. It, Tanya, I appreciate. I love that. I think that's brilliant. Um, and I think uh, adults could, if adults sometimes come up with all the rules, it's just a challenge to the students, right? Like, okay, I know I can come up with some. I can break one that they haven't even thought of yet, right? So let them let them think of them for sure. That's that's brilliant. Thank you. Well, folks, we are uh, coming coming close to the end of our time. Uh, even though I think that this this conversation could keep on going, but. But one thing that I think that um, if I were to pull one piece out that I, that I think is, is just so common between what, what Kim, you were saying in the beginning and, and Tanya, what you have been saying here is that, you know, you have to honor the user um, and that that user would have in, inherently has control over whether they're going to learn something or not, right? And so um, both of you have shown how, how we can map that out and how we can be flexible and creative with that and not necessarily be afraid that that those learners are going to have, uh, they're, they're going to be designers and they're going to have opinions and that those opinions are valuable because when we can apply them to a system like design thinking and apply them to, to an educational operational system like, like universal design for learning, what ends up happening is this agency happens, right? And there's a sense of professionalism to being a learner and there's a sense of uh, collectiveness that's to being a learner. And I, I just, I love that. I, I want to, uh, I have to pay some bills before we get out of here. So uh, I'm gonna share my screen one more time and then we'll come back for just uh, give you, Kim and, and Tanya, some, some time to think of some uh, parting words if you have any. So let me uh, go ahead and share my screen one more time. And we'll get out of here. <clears throat> so again, I just wanna say uh, on, on behalf of the IRN and, and all the folks that are out there, a huge thank you. Uh, to both Kim uh, Ducharme and, and Tanya Leon from, from uh, their respective places, CAST, uh, Kim being at CAST and Director of Educational User Experience and Design, um, and Tanya being from 7th grade English Department uh, at Richards Middle School in Fraser, Michigan. Please, you, you need to follow these folks on Twitter if you're on Twitter. Um, and uh, following them is easy. Uh, you can find Kim at, at Kim Ducharme. Uh, uh, on Twitter, and then uh, Tanya Leon at Mrs. T. Leon. Um, so please make sure that you're following them uh, and, and their brilliance. Um, also, folks, call for proposals. It's out the ULL, UDL IRN 2018 fifth annual international summit is fast approaching. We're back in Orlando. We've got more stuff planned. It's going to be crazy good time. It's April 25th through the 27th, and you definitely if you got something to say about the UDL world or you want to, uh, you want to just come, uh, you need to mark this down on your calendars, folks. It's, it's going to be just, uh, it's going to be a great time. 
We loved Orlando last year. Um, we're looking to grow our numbers uh, and uh, you want to make sure that you're in early. And if you have a proposal that you, that you think is a really brilliant idea, please put it in. Uh, and we'll be looking for those. Uh, so that's open right now. Also, we, I told you that Michigan was representing tonight. The Michigan clan is strong. Um, so uh, we are holding a UDL IRN Great Lakes regional event. Uh, and it'll be at Macomb, uh, where Sue Harden uh, does all her mad, her, uh, her mad doctoring and, and uh, UDL greatness. Um, but it's hosted by my organization, uh, Oakland Schools, Corinne's organization, Muskegon Area Intermediate School District, uh, and, and Macomb and the IRN. So we're taking, it's like, it's like when peanut butter meets chocolate, right? Two great tastes, four great tastes in this case, coming together for even better taste. If you are not in Michigan, that is okay. We still want to see you at this thing. Uh, it's October 23rd and 24th. Registration is up, folks, on the website, UDLIRN. Go to the events, find the Great Lakes uh, regional event. It is the inaugural, it is the kickoff, and we're going to do it right. Um, so, <clears throat> and in case you have noticed uh, my t shirt tonight, UDL Rockstars, you want your own. Uh, all the cool kids are wearing them. Please make sure that you go and get yours. Uh, here is the website for that. Uh, it's just a quick bit.ly. It'll take you there. All proceeds go to two very, uh, very great causes. They go for a scholarship fund for coming to the summit, and they go to a scholarship fund for going to the symposium from CAST. Um, and so we're trying to make a big splash with them. Uh, that was set up by Mindy Johnson, uh, an amazing, amazing UDL uh, member of the UDL fam, uh, person I am proud to call my UDL sister. And then one final thing. If you want to keep the UDL love happening, folks, come to UDL chat. It happens every first and third Wednesday of the month. We took some time off in, in July. We came back. We did it last night. We, we had a record numbers coming in, and we're only hoping to grow that more and more. Check us out. Uh, we have some great, great moderators. Mindy Johnson moderates. Ron Rogers moderates. Kit Hard moderates. Elizabeth Stein moderates. Kim Coy. We just, Joni Denger will be bringing, will, will be coming in and doing some guest spots. We uh, try to bring the biggest, the best, the brightest. It's a half hour. It's 9 p.m. Eastern time, uh, 6 p.m. Pacific time, first, third Wednesdays of, of the month. You got to show up. You'll love it. You can also catch this, the archives on, this, on Storyfy. If you go to that, storyfy.com, and type in hashtag UDL chat, you'll get all the great chats that have happened. And with that, I want to turn it back over uh, and thank the panelists one more time. Guys, thank you so much for coming on. <laughs> Uh, and I want to ask you, you got anything you want to leave us with? Uh, well, for me, I just have to say, Tanya, you are so inspiring. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you also. <laughs> I love you, and, Dr. My favorite. Thank you. So, and if anybody wants more materials, I put the link to one of the journey maps into the chat window and contact me for anything at any time. Again, Kim, can we put asking. that up? Can we put that up on the uh, the UDL IRN network and learn site as well? Yeah. All right. Okay. Fantastic. So we'll put that up with the network and learn so people can get it there too. Great. Thank you all yeah. guys for coming. We really appreciate it. Um, and I just want to tell Brian, uh, I told you so. Yeah, you did. You did. I, I never. Whenever. So I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna lay this out there. I know we got to get off, and it, but but I got to tell you. Um, I was supposed to come out to a session that Tanya ran and, and I unfortunately got waylaid um, and I'm so sorry that I missed it uh, because when I was talking with Sue, she's like, yo, she's legit. She's the real deal. And uh, I was like, I'm sure she is. Like, you know, I never, I never doubt when Sue Harden tells me somebody's legit. I don't ever doubt that. And uh, I'm, I'm so glad that you came on, Tanya, because I was like, mm-hmm, she is legit. Well, thank For real. you very much. Very, very blessed to work with Sue. She's wonderful. She's wonderful. Brilliant. Thank all you right. all. Guys. Thank That'll you. do it for us, folks. Coming back next month. Uh, look for the next network and learn. Um, uh, Sue will be hosting that one, and we'll post up the schedule. This will be posted up very soon, this recording. So thanks again, panelists, so much. Appreciate it.